In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Welcome, my beloved, to our weekly servants meeting. Last week, we did not meet because we had the blessing of having His Grace, Bishop Bula, speak to all of the servants uh, across the diocese, and he spoke to us directly from the Trinity Center, and he spoke to us specifically about the Holy Spirit. So I pray that all of you have had a chance to be able to listen to what His Grace shared with us. It really was a very beautiful session that His Grace uh, delivered to us. Beautiful teaching. Today, my beloved, we're going to be continuing the study that we're hoping to do over the summer. And so we're going to be studying the patristic work of St. Cyril of Alexandria, specifically in the book that is called On the Unity of Christ, which is a wonderful, wonderful work that is basically the culmination of anything and everything that St. Cyril had to teach us in regards to specifically the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Christology that was handed down to us from this great patristic father, St. Cyril of Alexandria. So today we will begin our study together. The last time we met, we discussed a little bit about who is the person of St. Cyril of Alexandria, the context in which he was the patriarch of Alexandria, the reality of everything that was happening surrounding him in the state of affairs surrounding the heresy of Nestorius and so on and so forth. And we spoke a little bit about the life and the teachings of St. Cyril. Now we're actually going to study many of these writings together. Uh, and so before we dive into it, it would be good for us to begin with a short prayer, and then we'll go ahead and jump right in. So let's pray, my beloved. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who is present everywhere and fills all, graciously come and abide in us, O good one, purify us of all iniquities and save our souls. Through the intercessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, St. Mary, and all the saints who have pleased you since the beginning, Please, Lord, accept our prayers and make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, my beloved, allow me to just share my screen with you. What I would like to share with you is the actual soft copy, if you wish. Um, Somebody was kind enough to send me a PDF copy of the book that I'll be able to share my screen with so that all of you who might not have the book might be able to follow along as we share together in some of these beautiful writings of St. Cyril. Uh, forgive me for some of the highlights here. There aren't too many of them, but they're, they're, they're important passages for us to consider nonetheless. So my beloved, we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Hopefully today we'll be able to study maybe the first 15 to 20 pages uh, of the writings of St. Cyril of Alexandria. I want you to first notice how it is that this very specific work seems to be um, you know, the, the, full, the full presentation of the maturity of St. Cyril's theology on very much the subject of who is Jesus Christ, so, which is the church calls Christology. And he writes this in a very interesting fashion. This book is formulated in a way where it almost looks like there is a dialogue between two people. Whenever you read this, you will notice that it is always written in the format where there is you know, person A and person B. And person A is always St. Cyril of Alexandria. And I am actually not entirely sure who person B is, but I know that this dialogue is meant to demonstrate the back and forth that can happen when you're having a theological discussion. So allow me to begin first and foremost by trying to dissect some of these major things that St. Cyril is teaching us. Our purpose is to have a book study. So the reason why you have the PDF in the front of you right now is that you can follow along with us and see for yourself the writings of St. Cyril. First, let's begin by addressing something that I love that St. Cyril does immediately right off the bat. He speaks about how it is um, that whenever you're going to be speaking about anything, don't be the kind of person who is only stimulated by intellectual thought. It is not enough for us to have theological conversations only at the level of you know, knowledge that we gather through life or to have philosophical views on things. He speaks about how it is that the most important thing is the pursuit of truth. So allow me to share with you some of the things that St. Cyril says. Try to read with me here. I know I'm sorry that the, the, the highlight here doesn't show it fully, but let's read it together. He says, the wise and eloquent men among the pagans are full of admiration for a well-tuned phrase. One of their main preoccupations is with elegance of expression. They are filled with the greatest enthusiasm for good style and take great pride in verbal dexterity. So he's saying a lot of people are just impressed by someone who is you know, capable of speaking in a way that is very eloquent. They are so preoccupied with the fact that the person in the front of them speaks properly, is very eloquent, is capable of expressing themselves in a beautiful way. And these are wonderful and beautiful things, but where is truth in this? And this is what St. Cyril is trying to make very clear. It is not sufficient for anybody, especially a Christian believer, to simply follow anyone who speaks beautifully. That what they're saying has to be true. 
And so the standard of what we believe is not whether or not what is spoken is expressed nicely, is expressed in a beautiful way, where the standard is very academic or intellectual or philosophical, saying the truth must be there. Where does he say this? He says very clearly, and you will see it here. Um, and let me try to figure out a way for you guys to be able to see you know, what it is that I am pointing at. I believe you can actually see my cursor, which is great. So you'll see it here. He says, I would say that they are sick from the lack of any true or proper notion of the nature and reality of God. Or rather, as mostly whole Paul puts it, they have been mistaken in their reasonings and their in insensible hearts are darkened. Thinking themselves wise, they have become as fools. Why is he saying this? Because in the previous sentence, he makes it very clear. The base material of their poets is merely lies, fashioned in rhymes and meters of grace and harmony, but for the truth they have little, if any, regard. And this is so important for the conversations that we have today, not only theological, but in anything that has to do with the truth. Unfortunately, today, many of our young men and women and many people in general are so taken aback by how people speak that they simply want to believe someone who speaks eloquently, who speaks beautifully, who speaks in a way that is enticing to them, that is very charismatic. But the question is, are we pursuers of truth? And this is what St. Cyril tries to make very clear. We only believe something because it is true, not because of the way that it's packaged or expressed. What makes the truth the truth is that it is the truth. And so it's only if I'm pursuing the truth that it can be revealed to me. If it's only, if this is what is motivating my studies, then clearly I will find that if I am praying to God to reveal to me this truth. One of the most beautiful things that we celebrate about the life of St. Moses the Strong, and we just finished celebrating his feast uh, just last week, you know, St. Moses had, you know, the, 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 the confidence to be able to pray and to say, oh son, if you are God, reveal yourself to me, and then to immediately follow it up with, oh God, whoever you are, whether you're the son or not, again, reveal yourself to me. It is this pursuit of truth that made the Lord speak to Moses and tell him, go to the monks of the wilderness of Skitis, and they will reveal to you who I am. We must have this pursuit. We must have this goal. Now, this eventually translates into the conversation where whatever is not the truth, specifically theologically, is considered to be heresy. And so we discover this immediately, very quickly, in the very second uh, page of the writings of St. Cyril. What does he say? He says, as for the inventors of impure heresies, he says it right here, as for the inventors of impure heresies, those profaners and apostates who have opened their mouths wide against the divine glory, those who have uttered perverted things, we could accuse them of having slipped in their madness as low as the foolish pagans, perhaps even lower, for it would have been better never to have known the way of the truth than once to have known it and to have turned away from the sacred commands which has happened unto them, which was, was handed unto them. So what is St. Cyril saying? He said, we got to be careful because it's one thing for you to be a person who doesn't know anything and to speak out of ignorance versus you to have the truth handed down to you and yet you reject it. So he says it would have been better for those who are heretics, those who have been given the truth, handed down to them in the tradition of the church, and then they pervert it versus a person who did never receive the truth and walks foolishly or blindly into whatever lies presented to them. And so he says it would have been better for them, right? Perhaps even lower, he says. We can, we can, he says, <laughs> we could accuse them of having slipped in their madness as low as the foolish pagans, perhaps even lower. This says something to you and me now who are believers. This sets the tone for the conversation that we're supposed to have as Christians. It is not enough for us to say that we have received the truth. We have to also make sure that we preserve the truth. The preserving of the truth is exactly what our forefathers and our foremothers, those who were holy, who came before us, that were willing to die for. Any deviation of the truth was unacceptable to them because to pervert the truth and allow any false doctrine to come in makes us worse off than even those who never knew the truth. The pagans worshiped their pagan gods, their false gods, foolishly, ignorantly, because they did not know better. But for the Christian who accepts a false doctrine about his own God and perverts the truth that was handed down to them, places himself in a situation that is much worse off. And here, St. Cyril explains that this is precisely what happens with people like the Arians. Listen to what he says about the Arian heresy. He says, 
This is an opportunity for us to consider the doctrine of such people. Some are foolish enough to bring down the word and the only begotten son of God from his supreme station. They reduce him from equality with God the Father by denying his consubstantiality and refusing to crown him with perfect identity of nature. So here he's speaking specifically about the Arians, those who once upon a time claim to say that there was a time when the son was not, that the son of God is nothing but a creature. He is not equal to God the Father. God the Father is the supreme God, and the son is nothing more than his primary and most elite creature, but a creature nonetheless. And so here, St. Athanasius or St. Cyril is basically saying that among those who were Christians and who deviated from the truth that make themselves even worse off than pagans are the Arians. He doesn't stop there. He also begins to express that it's not only them, but it's also those who begin to accuse or who begin to say that Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, and our Savior did not take on the fullness of what it means to be human. He's going to express this perfectly in this next passage. What does he say? He says, in effect, the first group, or sorry, the second group, he says, um, others more or less retrace the same path as those who have just mentioned. They fall into the snares of death and into the pit of hell as they pervert the mystery of the fleshly economy of the only begotten, teaching a folly, which is in a way the twin of that of their predecessors. In effect, the first group, insofar as lies within their power, drag down the word of God, born of God the Father, from their heights of divinity, even before his incarnation, while the second group have deceived the wage of war against the word, even in his incarnation. So the first one says that the Lord Jesus Christ is not equal to the Father, and they wage war against the eternal word, the only begotten Son of God, even before he became man. The second group, which he calls the twin of the first, and, and you have to understand, this is a huge accusation. At the time of St. Cyril, uh, the Arian heresy was a very, very um, rejected heresy. By this time, St. Athanasius had already come. The people had already rejected Arianism. Many wars were caused because of the Arian heresy. Uh, much conflict, at the very least, not many wars, but much conflict was caused because of the Arian heresy. And so to say, to believe what Nestorius is teaching, to believe that Jesus Christ, our Lord, was not perfectly human, is to make yourself equal to those who came before you those Arians who declared that heresy. He says, Arianism says that he was never God, whereas uh, the one who comes after says that he was never human. And in both cases, it is a very, very big problem. He sums this up perfectly by saying, we must keep the end in mind. Listen to what he says here, and I think it's said beautifully. Person B, whoever it is that he is going back and forth with, says, you discern correctly, for I have been consumed with zeal for the Lord and, even, and have been so put out by all this that I am deeply disturbed. This person who is speaking to St. Cyril is saying, what I have heard from these people is very worrisome to me. He says, I feel afraid when I look to where their teaching will end, for they have adulterated the faith that was handed on to us by the inventions of that serpent so recently appeared, injected their frigid, their frigid perverted, and idiotic notions like venom into the souls of the simple. He's basically saying what? I'm concerned about the things that I'm hearing, and I am bringing it up to you because ultimately I know where this will lead. He keeps the end in mind, he says. And this is so important to us as Christians. It's not enough for us to say, Yanni, let's not make things complicated. We all believe in Jesus. What's the big deal? As long as we all love each other, in the end, we all preach the same message. We have to be very careful. Sometimes teaching and saying those things is very, very dangerous. It is not right for us as servants of the Lord, those who have been entrusted with the faith of the Orthodox Church, for us to turn around and to say things like, it's all the same anyways. It's not all the same, Habadi. Not everyone who declares themselves to be Christian actually believes in who the Lord Jesus Christ taught us who he is. Our Christology is essential. Who you believe Jesus is, is extremely important to your faith. There are some people until today who believe that he is a creature. This is very worrisome. There are other people who believe that the Holy Spirit is not a person of the Holy Trinity. This is a huge issue, and both of them are found under the Christian banner. It is not sufficient for us to say, as long as we're all Christian, as long as we're this and that, there has to be the pursuit of truth. 
keep the end in mind. Ask yourself the question, if I believe this very specific teaching, what will it lead me to do? What will it lead me to believe? What does that say about the end result of my faith? And this is what's beautiful about what we're reading here. He says, I feel afraid when I look to where their teaching will end. Why? Because they have adulterated the faith that was handed on to us. How have they have uh, adulterated it? How have they introduced false things into this? He says, by the inventions of that serpent so it recently appeared in here, you'll discover very quickly that the serpent that he is speaking of is the patriarch of Constantinople, which is Nestorius, which will later be condemned as a heretic uh, by the church. Let's read something together, and I think it's really important. Um, St. Cyril almost immediately begins to teach and to say, how can people even believe that he is not perfectly human? So we'll see this here, and we're on page 52 right now. We'll read this together. He says, you speak of Nestorius, I think. I am already somewhat familiar with his thought, but as it is precise nature, my friend, I am not so sure. How can he say that the Holy Virgin is not the mother of God? Because here it was already said that Nestorius rejected the idea of calling her Theotokos, which is the bearer or the mother of God, but insisted that she only be called the mother of Christ. Um, and so person B responds and says, he maintains it because she has not given birth to God since the word was before her, or rather is before every age and time being co-eternal with God the Father. So he's suggesting that Nestorius is teaching is basically this idea that because the word of God existed before St. Mary, how can she give birth to him? How can she give birth to God if God exists before her, right? And this is where St. Cyril just answers in very simple terms, but yet it's so powerful and so blatant that it can't be ignored. He says, in that case, it is clear that they must also deny that Emmanuel is God. And so it would seem that the evangelist interpreted the term pointlessly when he said, and being translated, this means God with us. And he's, he's referencing here the Gospel of Matthew, as well as, you know, the, the prophecies of Isaiah. He says, and yet, because he is God made man, this is exactly how we ought to name the one that is born of the Holy Virgin, according to the flesh, as God the Father clearly teaches through the voice of the prophets. Again, St. Cyril is making it very clear. If they do not call her the Theotokos, and, and this is where I think some people get confused. Some people think that St. That, that Cyril was defending the Holy Virgin Mother. He wasn't just defending the Theotokos. To call her the mother of God is to defend the person that she gave birth to. He's actually defending who we believe Jesus to be. Because if you don't call her the mother of God, then she's the mother of what exactly? Who is she the mother of? And if you don't believe that she is the mother of God, that, that tells me something that you believe about Jesus that is completely wrong. And if you don't believe that he is God, then we are not saved. Now, some people might hear that and say, hold on a second. How did you go from she's not the mother of God to we're not saved? Well, St. Cyril explains this. He explains how it is that to deny that she gave birth to the word of God incarnate, then you are denying that he is the word of God incarnate. And if you deny that he is the word of God incarnate, then this will transition into many other beliefs that you have, where ultimately we are not saved, and scripture is wrong, St. Paul is wrong, the evangelists are wrong, and all of the forefathers who came before us are wrong. St. Cyril is going to show how the end of this teaching is one that completely destroys the faith. He continues, and he says here on page 53, and we'll read it together, he says, uh, he's actually making a beautiful claim where he talks about how it is that you know, um, that God spoke in the Old Testament through Moses. And he says that God was with Moses and God was with Elijah and God was with Noah and God was with Abraham. But yet none of that was called Emmanuel. It is insufficient for us to say that because God was with his people, that that is Emmanuel. What makes Emmanuel Emmanuel is that he has taken on our nature. He shows himself. His manifestation is in the form of a human being. He becomes one like us. He reveals himself to us by becoming like us. He says, why does his name apply only to the one who was so wondrously born of a woman according to the flesh in these last times of the world? Obviously, what he is teaching us here is that what we mean when we read scriptures is that God was among us. So much so that he actually points to the teachings that are written in the gospel of St. John chapter 1 
verses 14, where we know that he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What does St. Cyril says? He says, these are the teachings of a wanderer, of a sick mind that has strayed where it should not have gone so as to think that he, the ineffable being of the only begotten could ever be the fruit of flesh. He's basically saying that Nestorius is so off in his way of teaching that he thinks that no, no, God can never take on the form of a human being. He cannot take on flesh from a woman. That is to limit God. That is to place him in a box. That is to not realize that he did this for our sakes. He says, on the contrary, as God, he was ineffably begotten by nature from the Father and was co-eternal with him. For those who wish to know clearly how and in what manner he appeared in the form like our own and became man, the divine evangelist St. John says, and then he quotes John 1.14, which says in the word, became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Now, here's what's interesting. And St. Cyril knew this because he read Greek and he understood Greek and spoke Greek. In John chapter 1, verses 14, when it says, and he dwelt among us, the actual verb that is used is not dwelt, but rather tabernacled. The word tabernacle is this idea of setting a tent. This is where you will dwell. This is where you will stay. This is where you have now made yourself present among people. Your tent is where you pitched it and where you will sleep, where you will be. And so when we say that and the, uh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, what are we saying? He came where we were. He, he pitched his tent right next to us. He lived with us and in us. This tabernacling, if you wish, of the word of God literally means in Greek that he took on what is ours. He participated with us in the flesh. And that's why it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. St. Cyril is making it very clear that scripture does not deny this. Scripture makes it very clear that the word of God became all that we are, and he revealed himself to us in that way. Now, Nestorius and those who believe in his teachings will turn around and say, no, 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 hold on. That's not actually what was meant by the evangelist. And they have to change the meanings of words in order for them uh, to be able to prove their point. And again, St. Cyril answers this very eloquently by speaking of the limitations of language. And as you're reading this, you'll, you'll see it very clearly. Because the person here responds and says what? But they maintain that if the word became flesh, he no longer remained the word, but rather ceased to be what he was. So they are suggesting that if the word of God became a human being, then he is no longer the word of God. He's now only a human being. That he cannot remain what he is while also being human. And so again, St. Cyril says, this is nothing but foolishness and stupidity. The frenzy of a crazed mind. It seems that they are of the opinion that the term became inevitably and necessarily signifies change or alteration. So he's saying what? If you believe in this kind of thing, that what you think he became flesh means, and here the word became is you were once something and you became something else. You changed who you are. He says, this is foolishness because we don't use that word became in that same way in different passages of scripture. And he gives an example of this. Listen to what he says. He says, well then, when people sing in the Psalms and the Lord became my refuge. And again, oh Lord, you have become my refuge from one generation to the next. What will they say about this? Has the one of whom we sing laid aside his being as God and through some transformation passed over into becoming a refuge? Look at what he's doing. He's saying, if you're going to take a word like became, again, in John chapter one, it says, and he became flesh, right? And they're suggesting that because he says he became flesh, that that means he is no longer divine. He's saying, if that's the way you're going to understand the word became, then be consistent. Is that the way you understood, understand the word became every other time you read it in scripture? And he gives a beautiful example. The psalmist in Psalm 94 says that the Lord became my refuge. Is God no longer God because now he's somehow transformed into becoming a refuge? He says it again. Has he changed by nature into something else which the first he was not? What is he suggesting? He's saying be consistent. If you're going to understand the word became in one way, then apply it the same way everywhere. And he's giving this example to be able to say, you don't have to believe in this nonsense 
that because he became flesh, that that means he ceased from being what he already was. This doesn't imply change in God. What this implies is that he has taken on what is ours. He has manifested himself to us by becoming fully human. Again, St. Cyril does all of this with the intention of being able to prove he remains God while also becoming fully human. He doesn't simply take over the mind of a human being because this is one of the things that the heresies will teach. One of the questions that is asked to St. Cyril, he says the following. The person asks and says, if we are to preserve the immutability and unalterability as innate and essential to God, in what sense then should we say that the word has become flesh? So the person is asking, if we're saying that God doesn't change and that God cannot be altered, then what do we mean when we say that he became flesh? And St. Cyril answers and says, I don't have to tell you, just read St. Paul. And this is what I love about the fathers. St. Cyril does not give his opinion. He says, it is very clearly written out for us in scripture. One thing, my beloved, that makes the fathers the fathers is their love for scripture. They know the Bible inside out. And because they love scripture and the word of God, the Holy Spirit is capable of using them as the vessels of those that we now turn to to understand what scripture means. This is part of the holy tradition of the church. We don't let ourselves interpret scripture. We go back to the early church and we see what those who came before us whom the Holy Spirit used and, and, and utilized for the sake of the church, what they teach about the commentary of the scriptures. So when we see that St. Athanasius and St. Cyril and St. Gregory and St. Basil and St. Ambrose and all of those who came before us, what they all teach and what they all agree about when it comes to the commentary of scripture, we say that's what the Holy Spirit wants us to learn. I don't depend on my own interpretation. Listen to what he says. He says, the all-wise Paul, steward of his mysteries and sacred minister of the gospel proclamations, explains this for us when he says, let each of you having among yourselves that same mind which was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, assuming the form of a slave, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in fashions as a man, and he humbled himself, becoming obedient even to death the death on the cross. And here he is referencing Philippians chapter two, verses five to eight. This important passage, this very important passage of Philippians, which tells us that the Lord emptied himself for our sake, that he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, something to just hold on to, but he emptied himself. Why? For our salvation, for our sakes. And he did this by taking on the form of a human being, the form of a servant, and he was obedient even to the point of death. He explains this a little bit further by basically summarizing and saying what? He says, as God, he wished to make that flesh which was held in the grip of sin and death evidently superior to sin and death. He made it his very own and not soulless as some have said, but rather animated with a rational soul. And thus he restored flesh to what it was in the beginning. So what St. Cyril is saying saying that part of our salvation, part of what we believe of how God saves us is to recognize that what the purpose of the Lord Jesus was is that he took on what was ours that is corrupted, and this is our human nature. He took our human nature, which was corrupted and broken, and he turned it into what it was always supposed to be. He fixes what is broken in us, but he can't fix it unless he takes it on for himself. And so part of his salvific work for us is that he allows us to go back to be restored to what we were in the beginning. He says it even more beautifully here. He says, he thought it good to be made man and in his own person to reveal our nature honored in the dignities of the divinity. The same one was at once God and man, and he was in the likeness of men. All of this all of this is supposed to point to us to realize that what St. Cyril is arguing is that he had to become fully human in order to save us. If you don't believe he was fully human, then he did not restore our humanity. He did not fix the problem of sin and death. If all he did, and this is the accusation of Nestorius, or this is what some of them teach, is that the person of Jesus Christ was nothing but a human being, Sorry, Jesus of Nazareth was nothing but a human being, born of Mary, having a, a, having a, a, a human father, 
Uh, and then later on, the Lord took that man. He overtook him. He united himself to that man in order to do his work. But no, there's a difference between the Lord just taking on a human being and overtaking him almost some sort of like divine possession um, versus saying that he became fully human. He united his divinity to this humanity in the one person of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, the incarnate word of God. This mystery of who Christ is, is a big part of how we are saved. This is why we take from St. Cyril the great teaching, which says what? He took what is ours, and he gave us what is his. What did he take which was ours? Our humanity, our broken humanity, our corrupted humanity, our fallen humanity that needed to be un united to him, that needed to be rendered incorrupt, that needed to be given life because we were now under sin and death. All of this is what allows us to be able to say that his purpose was to save us. His purpose was to give us the healing that we needed in order for us to be saved. He makes this even clearer in page 57. Let's go to page 57 so we can read this. And forgive me, I'm going quickly so that we can try to get through some of the major teachings of, um, of St. Cyril uh, in, a good, in a good fashion, if you wish. He says, if it is true that the word became flesh in exactly the same way that he became a curse or sin, which is how they understand it, then surely he must have become flesh for the suppression of flesh. But how would this serve to exhibit the incorruptibility and the imperishability of flesh, which he achieved first of all in his own body? For he did not allow it to remain mortal and subject to corruption, thus allowing the penalty of Adam's transgression to continue to pass on to us. But since it was his own and personal flesh, that of the incorruptible God, he set it beyond death and corruption. What he's basically saying here is that it had to be his own flesh, not just the flesh of a random human being called Jesus of Nazareth. It had to be his very own in order for him to fix the brokenness that was in humanity. Our problem is that we were corrupt and that we were under sin and we were under death. And so to fix this, he has to make it his own because him being life, him being God, him being the source of love and the source of all that is good, when he makes it his own, he fixes it. And so he restores humanity to everything that it ought to be. This is how we are saved, by the way. And this is what St. Cyril is teaching. The saving work of God is not just understood as the sacrifice of the cross. It's the entire process of the economy of salvation. This is why His Grace Bishop Bullis was saying last week that we cannot limit the salvation of God only to the cross. Our salvation happens in the entire economy of salvation. The annunciation of the Lord Jesus Christ, his, his nativity, his baptism, his ministry, his transfiguration, uh, his, his dying on the cross, his betrayal, his burial for three days, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension and his sending to us the Holy Spirit, the entire economy of salvation, the entire process, everything he planned is what restores the human being. So to simply say I was saved only on the cross is to limit the work of the incarnation of the Lord. He became fully human to take on all that we are and to save all of us through everything that he does. And this is why St. Cyril argues and says, be careful because if they twist the meaning of the word, he became flesh, then they lose out on the entire process of how we are saved through his incarnation. He says, these people nonsensically twist the significance of the word became and then maintain that he became flesh in the same way as he became a curse or sin. And here you'll notice that he's referring back to how it is that St. Paul teaches us that him who knew no sin became sin, right? And how it is that he was also accursed for our sake. So he's saying the same way that they understand he became sin, they don't apply it. Uh, or they apply that to the same way that he became flesh. So they say, oh, no, no, he didn't become sin as in like he was actually sin. So he's saying, okay, to be consistent. You can't apply it one way here and a different way there. You have to understand what that word means. So he says, these people nonsensically twist the significance of the word became and then maintain that he became flesh in the same way as he became curse or sin. This is the way that the incarnation or rather the 
M, the en, uh, enmanment of the word, enmanment here be, means what? His becoming man. Or rather, the enmanment of the word is destroyed. They destroy it by forcing meanings on words. We do not do that. We do not take meanings of words and apply them liberally any which way we want. We have to understand how the church uses language, but we are not limited to the, the meanings of those words if they are improperly defined. We must understand what words mean in order for us to speak, um, in order for us to speak about the real theology that the church teaches us through the Holy Scriptures and through Holy Tradition. On page 59, St. Cyril basically made it very clear the attack that they make on the Son of God. He says, um, he says that basically what is happening here is that um, if you simply believe that he was just a regular human being that was taken up by God, then what you are doing here is that you are even finding a mistake with the teachings of the Son of God. He says, in that case, they are finding fault with the son and saying that his decision to undergo a voluntary self-emptying for our sake was misguided. And they're even saying that you got to be, he says, if you, if you take what they're teaching and you follow it all the way to the end, they're even accusing the Lord Jesus of doing things incorrectly. He says, surely in this way, the great and venerable mystery of piety is frustrated and rendered futile for are they not implying that the only begotten's wonderful economy in the flesh serve no purpose for the inhabitants of the earth? When St. Paul teaches us that he emptied himself for our sake, but they go around and say, no, that, that he didn't actually do that because that wasn't his own flesh. He didn't really become a servant the way that St. Paul says. He didn't take on the form of a bond servant in that way. He only did it poetically by occupying another human being called Jesus of Nazareth, says when they do that, they even distort the meaning of scripture. They even distort it when the Lord himself says that the son of man must offer himself as a ransom for many. He's offering himself. He's not offering some other human being that he's occupying. It is himself that he offers to us. When he says, take, eat of it, all of you, for this is my flesh. Take, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood. What is he saying? Is he suggesting that he's borrowing the body and the blood of another human being? Or is it his very own? You see how if you take one thing and you don't develop it properly, very bad things can happen in, in, in our beliefs and in our, in our theology. St. Cyril is summarizing this for us in order for us to understand the implications of how bad this heresy can actually be. Again, St. Cyril continues on the same page, just a little bit lower. He says... In short, he took what was ours to be his very own so that we might have all that was his. He was rich, but he became poor for our sake so that we might become enriched with his poverty. Again, he's quoting St. Paul here. And this is where we get the refrain of the Theotokeia in the Midnight Praises, where we say he took what is ours and he gave us what is his. When they say that the word of God did not become flesh, or rather did not undergo birth from a woman according to the flesh, they bankrupt the economy of salvation. For if he who was rich did not impoverish himself, abasing himself to our condition out of tender love, then we have not gained his riches, but are still in our poverty. If he did not give us all that is his by taking on what is ours, then there was no exchange. He didn't fix what we are, and we didn't take what is his. And if we didn't take what is his, we are still dead. We are still under the law of sin, and there is no hope for eternal life for us. This is the potential consequence. This is the potential consequence. And he says it, we are still enslaved by sin and death. This, this is the big concern. If you do not believe that he took on what is ours fully, then we did not receive all that he is fully. And if we do not receive all that he is fully, we are still enslaved to sin. We are still slaves to death. We are still poor, and we have not received his riches. St. Cyril continues, and then he argues again that this was his very own flesh. He says, look at it from another perspective. Is it not wicked and shocking to try to take away from God the word, his birth from a woman, according to the flesh? For how could his body possibly give life to us if it were not the very own body of him who is life. 
Again, we claim that we receive life from uh, the one who took on a human body and he offers his life to us through himself because he is life. And this is obviously the teaching of the Eucharist in the church, that we are participating in the very real flesh, the very real body and blood of the Lord Jesus. And it is life giving because that body belongs to him who is life. But if you say that that's not his body, and that he was just borrowing it, if you wish, then what? What are, what are we doing here? If she did not really give birth to him who is life giving, then we have a serious problem. There's so many of the teachings of the church that fall apart because of this. He says, and how could it be that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, 1 John 1, 7, if it was in reality only that of an ordinary man subject to sin? If this Jesus of Nazareth were nothing but just another human being whom God used, then that's the body of a sinful man who needed to be saved. That's the body of, or that's the blood of a sinful man who has no life in him. Again, how has God the Father sent his son, born of a woman, born subject to the law, which St. Paul says in Galatians 4.4? 4, 4. Or how was he condemned sin in the flesh? Romans 8.3. To condemn sin does not belong to someone with a nature like ours, under the tyranny of sin, an ordinary man. It cannot simply be an ordinary man that she gave birth to. Because it, it has to be God's very own body. It has to be God's very own humanity that he takes on. or else. Nothing is fixed, nothing is problem, nothing is solved. But insofar as it became the body of the one who knew no transgression, how rightly it could shake off the tyranny of sin to enjoy all the personal riches of the word who was ineffably united with it in a manner beyond all description. And I love the fact that he says in a manner, in a manner that is beyond all description. Why is it important to say that? Because no matter how much we speak about the mystery of who Christ is, no matter how much we speak about the great mystery of the incarnation, no words can suffice to try to wrap our minds around how he is perfectly divine and perfectly human. St. Cyril is not trying to limit his Christology and the teachings of the incarnation with words. He's trying to say we can use words to show just how infinite and mysterious this great and marvelous wonder of the revelation of Jesus Christ, the word of God incarnate, is. But to try to paint it the way that Nestorius did and to say that he is not born, that he was never born of a woman that was just another human being that was used or whatever it may be, then what we are doing is distorting the teachings of the church and destroying the work of salvation that God has given to us. So St. Cyril, basically, he says here, he says, um, where are we? Let me go to page 61. He says, he remained Lord of all things, even when he came for the economy in the form of a slave. And this is why the mystery of Christ is truly wonderful. What does he mean by wonderful? He means it is full of wonder. It is awesome in the sense where it is full of awe. It is outside of our capability of understanding. He says, indeed, God the Father said to the Jews through one of the prophets, look on this, you scoffers, be struck with a wonder and disappear, for I am going, uh, I'm doing a work in your days, a work in which you will not believe even if one were to explain it to you. And I love the fact that St. Cyril brings this up because he says, this is what God means. And this is what we mean when we say it is a mystery. That God will do things that we will not understand. And even when it is explained to us, we will not possibly accept it or understand it. Again, he says, indeed, the mystery of Christ runs the risk of being disbelieved precisely because it is so incredibly wonderful. For God was in humanity. And, and this is the summary of what St. Cyril is trying to teach all of us. That God became fully human. God was revealed to us in humanity. This is why you also have to understand, my beloved, that, you, that Christianity is so provocative to many people. Christianity is so provocative because unfortunately to many people, how can you say that God became man? And this is what Nestorius would say. How, how would you say that God was willing to be a baby? That, that God was willing to nurse at the breasts of a woman? How can you say that he was young enough to be so fragile and so vulnerable? How can you say that God needed to learn to walk like a human being? That he needed to learn language like a human being? That God was capable of falling sick? How can you say those things? 
And people say, what you are doing there is that you are humiliating God. Actually, that's precisely what we're saying. God was humiliated for our sakes. Humiliated here comes from the idea of he was humbled. He emptied himself. He emptied himself and took on the form of a bondservant for my sake. That's what makes his love so great. That's what makes his offering to us so wonderful. Somebody will say, but how can you say that? No, we didn't say that. That's precisely what he revealed to us. That's precisely what his love has declared to us. That's precisely what scripture says. We are not suggesting that we are lower in God. We are suggesting that God voluntarily lowered himself. He took what is ours so that we can receive what is his. This is precisely the mystery of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, if we continue to read a little bit further, um, Sincero asks a question. He says, if God did not hold marriage in dishonor, but on the contrary honored it with a blessing, then why did the word who is God make a virgin the mother of his own flesh with a conception straight from the Holy Spirit? He's trying to ask the question, you know, why did he have to be born of a virgin who did not receive the seed of a human being through sexual intercourse? The person answers, says, I am unable to say. So listen to what is really beautiful here. Listen to what St. Cyril says. He says, will the reason not become abundantly clear to anyone who reflects on it? As I have said, the son came, or rather was made man, in order to reconstitute our condition within himself. First of all, in his own holy, wonderful, and truly amazing birth and life. This was why he himself became the first one to be born of the Holy Spirit. I mean, of course, after the flesh. So that he could trace a path for grace to come to us. He wanted us to have this intellectual regeneration and spiritual assimilation to himself, who is the true and natural son, so that we too might be able to call God our father and so remain free of corruption as no longer owning our first father, that is Adam, in whom we are corrupted. What is he saying? He's saying that the whole purpose of him being born of the Holy Virgin, uh, of, the, of the Holy Virgin Mary and of the Holy Spirit so that he can change us. It is not God who needs to change to save us. And some people might say this. Some people might unfortunately make the claim that a big part of our salvation is that God needed changing, that there was something wrong in God, that God's wrath had to be satisfied, that there was something wrong within God that needed to be fixed. And that's why the sacrifice on the cross. But the early church and the Orthodox belief and what was handed down to us through both scripture and tradition is that the real change was not required in God. Change was needed in us in order to change the human being from the inside out. He became perfectly human and introduced to us what it means to be born of the Holy Spirit. It was important for him to break the cycle of what Adam did. And Adam handed down death, but Christ hands down life and union with God. And so he breaks the cycle, no longer being born of the human seed, but being born directly of the seed of God, right? And this is precisely what St. Cyril was trying to teach all of us. Something so beautiful that unfortunately oftentimes is misconceived or misinterpreted. He goes on to say, and this is beautiful, he says, um, Yes, he quotes here John 1, 3, where he says, all this happened not from blood, nor of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but from God through the spirit. Indeed, Christ once said, call no man on earth your father, for you have but one father who is in heaven. And because he came down into our condition solely in order to lead us to his own divine state, he also said, I am going to my father and your father, to my God and to your God. And in this case, the heavenly one is his natural father. And in our case, he is our God. But he speaks these words and says, my father, your father, my God, your God, because he speaks in the state where he is emptied, where he has become fully human for our sakes. Still, he gave his very own father even to us, for it is written, yet to those who did receive him, those that believed in his name, he gave them authority to become the children of God. Again, everything that the Lord Jesus does is for our salvation. Everything. His, his, his taking on of what it means to be perfectly human all of it 
all of it is for our sakes. All of it is for us to be able to understand that what he does for us in becoming fully human is that he takes our brokenness, he takes everything that it means to be human, and he restores it. He restores it by making it his own. Because when he makes it his, it goes from a state of corruption to a state of incorruption. It goes from a state of alienation from God to a state of union with God. It goes from a state of being enslaved to sin and death to be completely alive, fully united to him who is life. And to say that he wasn't human or to say that he borrowed the life of a human being called Jesus of Nazareth, then you're destroying salvation. You're not simply saying that, oh, this is how I think he saved us. What you're actually saying is that we're not saved at all. Again, remember this. The church does not fight over words for the sake of fighting over words. The purpose of the church is to say, we believe something and there's a reason for that belief. If you twist the belief of the church, it could take you down a very dangerous and wrong path that could lead to heresy, that could lead to death, and that could lead ultimately to a person not believing in Christianity at all, but believing in something that is worse than paganism. All of this is just the introduction, the first 15 pages of what we've read from St. Cyril. Imagine how much more we will discover as we continue to read this wonderful work called On the Unity of Christ. Again, I urge you, if you have not yet purchased it, it's only $17 on Amazon. It's a wonderful book for your library. The introduction of the book um, it tells you about the life of St. Cyril. It's about 45 pages, just the introduction. The rest of the book is, is less than 80 pages. It's a very beautiful read filled with so many riches. For those of you who prefer Arabic, um, maybe we can have one of the service tell us where they got the book in Arabic. Uh, but overall, this is a wonderful book for our library that I think is so important for us to have. Uh, my beloved, this will be the end of our first session as we studied it together. And hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we'll continue to dive a little bit deeper into the great teachings of our father among the saints and so of Alexandria. To God be our glory now and forever and unto the ages of all ages. Amen. Are there any questions or comments from anybody who is with us here before we conclude in prayer? Very well. We'll go ahead and say a small prayer and we'll conclude, my beloved. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. O King of peace, grant us your peace. Establish for us your peace and forgive us our sins. For you is the kingdom, the power, the blessing, and the majesty now and forever. And unto the ages of all ages, Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Give us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord, guarantee of Jesus Christ, the gift and the communion of the Holy Spirit with you all.